Do, 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 do. All right, we're live on YouTube now. Okay. Should we go right at seven? Uh, yeah, unless you want to wait a few minutes just for some stragglers. Okay, we'll wait till 7.02. Okay. <clears throat> I'll ask everybody to mute and then I'll just put you on speaker view. So, okay. <clears throat> Anybody hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, they're mu everybody's muted. <laughs> Somebody's chatting here. Oh, the Hendersons are going on YouTube. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Michael, please mute yourself. I see it's right here. Okay. 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 Yeah, get it out of this thing. Yes. Dick, can you make me co-host? Then I can do that. That's fine. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Okay. Okay, everybody's muted. Okay. Why are you in speaker view? Hmm? Okay. All right, okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our adult education tonight. Um, this is our sixth and final adult education uh, course of uh, this year. Um, I've had a lot of fun actually putting this together because first of all, you can come at the notion of what makes Jewish food or what makes food Jewish 
or what makes Jewish cuisine from so very many different uh, avenues. Um, I want to thank uh, the people who have sent me anecdotes and articles, Suzanne Paley and Barry Goldenberg, and um, they've been very amusing to read and I actually may encompass, en encompass some of the ideas in some of these articles in my discussion this evening. Um, first and foremost, I want to talk about kashrut or keeping kosher or the Jewish dietary laws. Um, my first statement is kashrut or keeping Jewish dietary laws is not what makes food Jewish. It's not what makes Jewish cuisine. It may be one of the elements in some Jewish food, but it is certainly by no means the main ingredient in, uh, in, in, Jewish, in Jewish cuisine. First of all, kashrut, for those of you who are or are not familiar, um, is the body of law that deals with what foods we can eat and what foods we cannot eat, um, how those foods are to be prepared, and how those foods are to be eaten, and with what it can be eaten. The word kashrut comes from the Hebrew word kasher, kaf, uh, resh, shin, um, or kaf, shin, resh, uh, meaning, it, it, and it doesn't mean blessed, it doesn't mean uh, holy, the word kashrut or kasher means fit. It means proper. It means correct. It means worthy. Um, it's the same root as the more commonly known word kosher, which describes few foods that meet all of these various different standards. The word kosher, though, can also be used and is often used to describe ritual objects that are made in accordance with Jewish law and are fit or are worthy for ritual use. Contrary to all kinds of popular misconceptions, rabbis and other religious officials do not bless food to make it kosher. There are blessings that observant Jews recite over food before they eat it. But these blessings have nothing to do with making food kosher. Food can be kosher with a rabbi or with a priest or without a rabbi or without a priest. Um, they never have to be involved with it. For example, vegetables from your garden are undoubtedly kosher as long as they don't have any bugs, which are not kosher. Um, in our modern world, though, of processed foods, it's difficult to know what ingredients are in your food and how they are processed. So it may be helpful to have a rabbi or a knowledgeable person examine the food and its processing and its ingredients to assure kosher consumers that the food is kosher. Um, and, and for food that, are, that is kosher, uh, there are certifying organizations that issue something called the Tudat Kasher, which is a, a kosher certification or a kosher certificate. Um, kosher dietary laws are observed all year round, not just during Pesach or Passover. Um, there are additional dietary restrictions during Pesach, and many foods that are kosher the year round may not necessarily be kosher for Passover. A bagel, for example, can be kosher for year round use, but is certainly not kosher for Passover. Foods that are kosher for Passover, though, are always kosher for year-round use. 
and much to the dismay of many people, there is actually no such thing as kosher style or kosher style food. Kosher is not a style of cooking. Chinese food can be kosher if it's prepared in accordance with Jewish law. And there are lots of different kosher Chinese restaurants, say in New York and Philadelphia and Miami. Um, traditional Ashkenazic foods like knishes and bagels and blintzes and matzo ball soup. All of those things can be non-kosher if they're not prepared in accordance with Jewish law. When a restaurant calls itself kosher style, it usually means that the restaurant serves these traditional Jewish foods. And it almost invariably means that the food is not actually kosher. For example, I knew a kosher style deli that routinely served kosher bologna and cheese sandwiches. The bologna may have been kosher, but serving the meat and the cheese in the same sandwich was definitely not, which made it non-kosher. Food that is non-kosher, most of you have probably heard this term, is commonly referred to as treif, which literally means torn, a reference to the commandment not to eat animals that have been torn by other animals. So treif generally refers today to any non-kosher food, not just meat from a torn animal. So why do people observe laws of kashrut? Well, there are many modern Jews that think the laws of kashrut are simply primitive health regulations that have become obsolete with modern methods of food preparation. There is no question there, there are some dietary laws which have some beneficial health effects. For example, the laws regarding kosher slaughter are so sanitary that kosher butchers and slaughterhouses have been exempted from many of the USDA regulations. However, health is not the only reason for Jewish dietary laws. Many of the laws of kashrut have no known connection to health. To the best of our modern scientific knowledge, there is no reason why a camel or a rabbit, both treif, is any less healthy than a cow or meat that comes from a goat, both kosher animals. In addition, some of the health benefits to be derived from kashrut were not made obsolete by the refrigerator. For example, there's some evidence that eating meat and dairy together interferes with digestion and no modern food preparation technique reproduces the health benefit of the kosher law of eating them separately. So why is it that Jews choose to observe the laws of kashrut? Well, Bluntly, because the Torah says so. The Torah doesn't specify any reason for these laws. And for a Torah observant traditional Jew, there is no need for any other reason. Some Jewish sources have suggested that the laws of Kashrut fall into the category of Chukim, laws for which there is no reason. And we show our obedience to God by following these laws, even though we don't know the reason. Others, however, have tried to ascertain God's reasons for imposing these laws. To the best of my understanding, I have found that people observe these laws of kashrut simply because it is designated as a way to bring people closer to holiness. 
the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, good and evil, pure and defiled, the sacred and the profane is very important to Jews and to Judaism. Imposing rules on what you can and can't eat ingrains that kind of self-control, requiring us to learn to control even our most basic and primal instincts. How difficult is it to keep kosher? That depends on how much and how important it is for you to do so. Let me just give you the nine general rules about kashrut, then I'm gonna move on to something else. Certain animals may be eaten, may not be eaten at all. This restriction includes the flesh, the organs, the eggs, the milk, and of all forbidden animals. This applies only to eating the animals. You can play football with a pigskin ball. You can wear pigskin gloves or pigskin shoes. It's simply what you ingest. Of the animals that may be eaten, the birds and the mammals must be killed in accordance with Jewish law. Third, all blood has to be drained from meat and poultry or broiled out of it before it's eaten. Fourth, certain parts of permitted animals may not be eaten. Five, fruits and vegetables are permitted, but must be inspected for bugs, which, as I mentioned earlier, cannot be eaten. Meat, the flesh of birds and animals, cannot be eaten with dairy. Fish, eggs, fruits, vegetables, and grains can be eaten with either meat or dairy. Seventh, utensils, including pots and pans and other cooking surfaces that have come into contact with meat may not be used for dairy or vice versa. Utensils that have come into contact with non-kosher food may not be used with kosher food. This applies only where the contact occurred while the food was hot. Eight grape products made by non-Jews may not be eaten. And nine, there are a few other rules that are not universal. And that's really all I want to say about, about kashrut to give you sort of just an overview of what kashrut is in traditional Judaism. Now, let me continue. Um, there is an old joke, and the joke is told about a Martian who accidentally crashes his spaceship on the streets of New York City. He goes in search of a new set of tires for his spacecraft, and on his way, he happens to pass a bagel shop, noticing the bins of bagels in the window. Well, the Martian goes in and inquires about purchasing some of those tires for his spaceship. These aren't tires, they're bagels, the owner says. Here, try one. The Martian takes a bite. Man, he says, smacking his lips. These would go great with cream cheese and lox. That time-tested combination might have been immediately obvious on Mars but it surely wouldn't have been in Casablanca or Aleppo or Calcutta or in any of the other Jewish communities around the world where bagels were about as common as Martians. We might, for that matter, imagine an equally perplexed expression on the face of a Jew from Vilna who was offered a place plate of sizzling hot carciofi alla guida. For while this was a defining dish for Roman Jews, to a resident of the Pale of Russia, the idea of artichokes in the Jewish style might well have seemed a contradiction in terms. In Tunisia, Jewish cooks have made couscous. In India, curry. In Yemen, flatbread in New York, cheesecake. So what then 
might legitimately be considered Jewish food? And how would we even go about defining such a thing? If we were, for example, to restrict ourselves to foods made by all of the world's Jewish communities, the ones that are Roman and Vilner would both recognize as Jewish, the menu would be a very short one, scarcely sufficient for a single meal. It would include those foods created to address religious needs common to Jews everywhere, among them the overnight Sabbath stew prepared before Friday sundown to be eaten warm on Saturday when work is prohibited. And though the names for that stew and the ingredients used in it vary from place to place, most people know it as cholent. Charoset, the sweet paste that on Passover symbolizes the mortar used by Israelite slaves under Egyptian bondage. Though the charoset of one country may well bear scant resemblance to the charoset of its neighbor. And finally, matzah, the bread of affliction, though not many dishes are made from matzah. Even here, in what we might call the foundational dishes of Jewish cookery, all but one are shared in a broad sense, not in specific detail. Surely, one definition is too restrictive when it limits a cuisine to something like sheets of matzah. But neither should we head in the opposite direction and declare Jewish food simply to be food made by Jews. Though this would seem logical enough, and at one time might have made some sense, it is no longer applicable in a world in which regional distinctions have blurred so that in any metropolitan area, one can choose from a multitude of ethnic cuisines. And the trendiest restaurants often feature the fusion of two or more. And at a time when many Jews, even those who consider themselves observant, no longer keep kosher. I'm not sure how many people you think keep kosher in the world, but in 2019, a Pew study was done. And one of the questions asked in the Pew study was about kashrut. And for, it might surprise you to know that only 17% of the people who were surveyed claimed today or in 2019 to observe kashrut. Today, a list of foods made by Jews would include everything from cheeseburgers to jambalaya. And in that regard, in fact, of a food being kosher is insufficient in itself, as I mentioned earlier. After all, a tossed green salad is not a Jewish food merely because its components happen to conform to Jewish dietary laws. And though it might have become a favorite buffet item at an upscale Orthodox wedding, we would be hard pressed to define sushi as Jewish. Like all traditional foods, Jewish food is a product of history and it's a product of geography. It is an expression of the area in which it has been made. In this case, the area happens to span not merely a particular country, as for instance, with Italian and French food, which contains significant regional variations, or even much of a continent, as with Chinese food, but instead, so much more of the entire world. And to help in discussing such broad geographical area, Jewish food is usually separated into a number of major categories. Um, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, and Mizrahi are generally the three categories today that Jewish cuisine is divided into. 
It was in the unforgiving climate of Russia and Eastern Europe that the preponderance of Ashkenazi cuisine came about. The vegetables of the diet were those that could grow well in cold weather and poor soil, cabbages, potatoes, turnips, and the like could be those things that could be stored to survive a long northern winter. With few available fresh herbs, cooking leaned heavily on garlic for additional flavoring, with sugar, honey, and cinnamon for sweet dishes. As much of the region is landlocked, the fish were primarily freshwater species, such as carp and pike. Beef was a luxury item. Chicken was far more plentiful, and not a bit of it was wasted, from the feet used in thickening soup to the fat that was, along with butter for dairy meals, the chief frying agent. Of course, there were important differences within Ashkenazic cooking. The foods of Poland, for example, tended to be sweeter, those of Lithuania, more peppery. But overall, the foods were similar, as is to be expected from a relatively limited geographical area and from a terrain of such reluctant disposition. Precisely the opposite is true of Sephardic food, which has essentially come to include all, Nashken, all non Ashkenazic cuisines, including those of the Mediterranean, the Balkans, North Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, and India. There aren't many points of commonality to be found in the cooking of such disparate geographic areas. Still, I can make some generalizations about Sephardic food, and particularly by contrasting it to Ashkenazic food. Thanks to, first of all, much more agreeable climates, Sephardic foods feature a far broader range of vegetables, eggplant, tomatoes, okra, artichokes, fennel, countless others. Rather than potatoes, the staple starch may be rice or couscous, augmented by legumes such as lentils or chickpeas. The frying agent is not chicken fat, but oil, typically olive oil. Often, not, often as not, chicken is not a luxury meat with lamb or beef, much more common. And the essential flavorings include not just garlic, but a vast array of herbs and spices, including everything from cilantro and curry leaves to cumin, coriander, and cardamom. From Morocco, Mela to the Polish ghetto, Greek seaside to the Hungarian countryside, Jewish cooks have worked with a remarkable diversity of ingredients and cooking styles. Wherever Jews have wandered, they have modified their cooking to accommodate the new ingredients, flavors, and even more traditional dishes of the adopted land. Oftentimes, of course, they had to adapt these dishes to conform to the Jewish dietary laws that I spoke about earlier by exchanging permitted cuts of meat or species of fish for forbidden ones, or by eliminating combinations of meat and dairy. This happens everywhere, but it was most common among the Jews of Central and Eastern Europe, where pork is a staple ingredient, lard is used for frying, and meat is often combined with dairy products. In Alsace, for example, Jews replaced the slab of bacon, typically found in local food, with corned beef or with pickled tongue. While in Russia, borscht was made in its meat varieties with beef instead of pork and was not garnished with sour cream. That was saved instead for the dairy version of that particular, of that particular soup. Certain adaptations had to be made as well. 
by the Jews living among Hindus in India, such as cooking meat dishes with oil instead of with clarified butter. But in general, these adaptations were less common there than in Christian Europe. They were even less so among Jewish communities of North Africa and the Middle East, where the local Muslim population likewise eschews the consumption of pork typically uses oil for frying and rarely mixes meat and milk in its cookery. Among those Sephardic Jews, it is by no means uncommon to find foods made in precisely the same manner as they are in the wider society, as with, say, things like hummus, as, which has long been popular in the Middle East, in both Jewish and Arab communities alike. Hummus is thus simultaneously a Jewish and an Arab food. And in this, it is but one of many. Why is it that we never focus on things that unite us, like falafel? So Jewish food cannot be reduced to a set of dietary laws, a particular cooking style, or a combination of flavored ingredients. It can't be defined by its internal similarities, for it varies too widely from place to place, from century to century, nor by its differences from the non-Jewish food around it. It is at once something grander and of necessity less specific. Jewish food is that which has sustained the Jewish people for countless generations, wherever they happen to be, wherever they happen to live, whatever time period they happen to be living in. It is loaves baked in community ovens and stews kept warm overnight in the dying embers of the Sabbath fire. It is a honey sweetened roast to greet the new year, a lemony soup to break the fast after Yom Kippur. It's a roast chicken or fish on Friday night. It is the cookies and confections that were kept on hand to welcome friends who might drop in one afternoon. It is all the dishes crafted to fashion, however briefly or incompletely, luxury from poverty. All the dishes who na whose names evoke memories of parents and grandparents and dreams of those whom one has heard only stories. It's the food that is still made in immigrant communities held on to like old photographs and letters and tattered prayer books. The key to the past, the key to their ancestral home, to preserve a sense of connection to a place that may be forever lost. Jewish food and Jewish cuisine is not easy to simply put into a box and label as Jewish. The diaspora suffered by Jews over the centuries had meant that the Jewish people honor the laws of kashrut, keeping kosher, and have had to incorporate the ingredients at hand. Other religious requirements for keeping the Sabbath mean there are prohibitions about creating fire on Shabbat, and in many ultra-Orthodox homes, electricity is forbidden. Jewish food also bears the mark of migratory patterns and a background that includes socioeconomic status and access to basic food groups. As I mentioned, there are three main styles of Jewish cuisine. They are Ashkenazi, Sephardi, and Mizrahi. Other cultural influences on Jewish food include Persian, Yemenite, Indian, Latin American, as well as the influences on Jewish dishes from Central Asia to Ethiopia. Israeli cuisine is now, in the year 2022, recognized worldwide thanks to chefs like Yotam Odolenghi, Michael Solomonov, and Eyal Shani, 
who brought us Israeli foods and introduced us to Middle Eastern dishes and spices like sumac and zetar. Israel has a strong foodie base and a growing reputation for some amazing culinary creation. Street food in Jerusalem is a star in the Shuk, which is a Jewish market in the center of Jerusalem and another one in Tel Aviv. Jewish foods, the, the Jewish foods that influence the, from the Torah and the Talmud. Within Judaism, the dietary laws, as I mentioned, are found in the Torah and laid out in far more detail in the Talmud. These dietary laws governed what and how to eat in ancient times and laid out the types of foods that were related and what was applied to a particular celebration or festival or a certain occasion, keeping kashrut or kosher or sort of the backbone of Jewish food by prescribing and proscribing the allowed foods and how they must be prepared. As I mentioned to you, Jewish kosher cuisine does not necessarily define Jewish food. Jewish food in America is a somewhat richer version of the Ashkenazi food in Eastern Europe. Jewish American food is deeply influenced by the regions. And so you'll find things like gefilte fish made with salmon and matzo ball soup served with hot sauces, depending on the area of the United States that you might live in. Jewish food favorites are things like gefilte fish, bagels, borscht, lakshin, latkes, rugelach, matzo balls, kugel, Kreplach, chicken soup, challah, humantaschen, knishes, pierogies, chopped liver, cabbage rolls, or stuffed cabbage, carrot simis, potato borax, cholent, blintzes, brisket, pastrami. All of these things have their origin in other places all throughout, all throughout the world. So what is it then, after having said all of this, what is it that makes food Jewish? There's a circumstantial pragmatism and syncretism of Jewish cuisine. If, for example, I had grown up in New York City, I, made, I might have well imagined that Jews had been eating Chinese on Sunday nights ever since Moses led them out of the desert. Yet another tradition born of circumstance, the first mass wave of Jewish immigrants to settle the city at the turn of the century, created a new world shtetl in the Lower East Side. Where was it? Adjacent to Chinatown, whose exotic aromas tempted more adventurous Jewish diners over to sample a cuisine quite unlike anything that their mothers cooked. And those mothers saw their own advantages in a weekly excursion for the cheap, delicious fare offered in the raucous restaurants of Chinatown that served as communal kitchens to fellow immigrants. It could save her having to cook on Sunday nights. Thus, the roots of tradition, eating Chinese food on Sunday nights, and even today, there are at least 12 kosher Chinese restaurants in New York to cater to a minority of Jews who continue to observe the biblical dietary laws. Of course, the fact that there are also 20 Italian kosher restaurants, five kosher sushi bars, six kosher bur burger joints, and two of each French, Mexican, and Indian restaurants that are certified kosher, signifies the depth of temptation to which New York living has subjected the Jewish palate. Indeed, at an upmarket ultra-Orthodox Lubavitch wedding these days, you're more likely to be served sashimi than chopped herring. 
historically, we have been a wandering people. And along the way, we've let our appetites and our imaginations roam, taking notes on the culinary habits of all those in whose midst we've lived over the centuries. That's put a tension between denial and temptation at the very heart of Jewish cooking. Denial prescribed by dietary laws, originally evolving out of ancient hygiene concerns, but subsequently upheld as a measure of piety. Temptation in the form of local cuisines Jews encountered in their dispersal across Europe and Asia and North Africa. The resolution of that tension has always been syncretic, to incorporate local recipes into the Jewish family cookbook, adapting them in keeping with Jewish dietary laws and giving them a Yiddish or Ladino name and inflection. Today, you can find most of the Jewish foods that my grandfather was weaned on in New York's Polish and Ukrainian diners, pierogin or pierogi, kasha, latkes, potato pancakes, shav, borscht, and more. But Sephardic Jews, those whose diaspora included the Iberian and the Aegean peninsulas, the Bosphorus and the Maghreb, before setting sail for climes as exotic as Brazil and Cuba and Jamaica, would find the fare at most New York Jewish delis more than a little bland. Where dill is probably the herbal mainstay at a place like Katz's, Sephardic dill, excuse me, Sephardic chefs would be more inclined to reach for allspice and cayenne pepper. And where Jews of Eastern European origin would celebrate a family or religious occasion with cheesecake recipes originally learned in Russia, Sephardim might be more inclined towards celebrating with almond cake and baklava. But Jewish cooking is more than simply a patchwork of traditions adapted from various exiles. There are its mainstays, such as something I've mentioned before, cholent, which actually can be traced back to biblical times, and others that, whatever their origins, have been adoptively Jewish for centuries. For example, think bagels. Believed to have originated in the Roman era, the boiled and baked O-shaped roll was brought to Poland by Jews in the 12th century, from where it spread both east and west. Lox? That's another story. Cured and lightly smoked salmon was probably a taste acquired in Northern Europe. Indeed, the word is simply a Yiddish version of the German lox. The, German lo the word lox in German means salmon. It's spelled not L-O-X, but L-A-C-H-S. The syncretic habits of Jewish cuisine may have made it most at home here in the United States, which likes to think of itself, if not as a melting pot, then probably as a buffet table. America encourages its immigrants to sample each other's cuisines. And Jews have been doing that for centuries. Here in America, we're part of the mix. After all, if you think about it, these days, you can get a bagel at McDonald's. So then what exactly is Jewish food? Well, it's a great question, but also a complicated one. It's one that I love because it indicates to me that people are thinking both critically and broadly about what it means to eat Jewish. 
Jewish cuisine, for the most part, has been reduced to a short list of things. Latkes, pastrami, matzo ball soup, and other European hit, Eastern European hits. It's also regarded as immutable, a fixed thing, passed down from generation to generation since time immemorial. And woe to the cook who takes creative license with Bubby's Kugel recipe. But in reality, Jews have moved around, as I said, a lot throughout history, sometimes by choice and often by force. And so we have lived and we've cooked just about everywhere. The Jewish merchant, merchants who once traded along the Silk Road and elsewhere Meanwhile, swap not only spices and other goods, but also ideas. And as a result, Jewish cuisine is at once profoundly global, deeply religious, and most importantly, eminently adaptable. For thousands of years, wherever Jews lived, they created their own micro cuisines based on kashrut and the local terrier and food traditions. In some cases, they adapted a local dish to fit their dietary and ritual needs. Hungarian Jews, for example, serve chicken paprikash without the sour cream. Most other Hung Hungarians stir into the sauce. In other cases, a traditional recipe was changed to incorporate regional flavors. Take Cholent, the slow-cooked 24-hour Sabbath stew by Ashkenazis, and Hamim and Dafina in Sephardic communities. It has endless variations, which are based on local ingredients. Fragrant rice and chicken in Iraq, fatty beef, potatoes and beans in Poland, chickpeas, cracked wheat, and turmeric in Morocco. As a result, Jewish cuisine is a delicious matchup, mashup of all kinds of dishes filtered through a prism of spices and other ingredients. In India, for example, we had dishes from the past and we saw what our neighbors were making and what looked good. And we invented a new dish. That's how Jewish recipes evolved. And the evolution continues as evidenced in dishes like gefilte fish a la Vera Cruzana, which was developed by Ashkenazi communities who settled in Mexico in the early and mid 20th century. They took the classic Jewish fish appetizer and added tomato, oregano, olives, and other Spanish inflected regional flavors. And then there are the Nutella filled hamantaschen, quickly growing favorite in America, thanks to our obsession and infatuation with the Italian chocolate hazelnut spread. Purists might call this modern creation an abomination. It needs to have mun or poppy seeds or prune, but others would swear their Purim celebration isn't complete without Nutella humantashen. And today you can find humantashen s'mores made with chocolate, marsh chocolate and marshmallows. You can find halva humantashen as a sweet reminder that Jewish cuisine is as expansive as our imaginations. And yet, in this global nature that makes Jewish food canon so difficult to define. Historically, kashrut provided sort of the natural perimeter for Jewish food, regardless of whether home cooks were feeding their families in Bulgaria, England, or Tunisia, where kosher laws served as a constant reminder of the sacredness of what we put into our bodies. But even today, when plenty of Jews eat decidedly non-kosher diets, it would be difficult to make a case that BLTs, cheesy lasagna that are made with meat sauce, 
or clam chowder are Jewish. But beyond that, what are the boundaries? Well, I'm not sure that there are any. Definitions honed over years of fumbling to answer the question at cooking demonstrations is that Jewish cuisine includes any dish that holds meaningful, cultural, historical, or ritual significance to Jewish communities. But, and this is an important but, to identify a dish as Jewish does not claim it as exclusively Jewish. A handful of foods like haroset and matzah are so closely tied to a particular holiday practice that it's safe to assume they have a distinctly Jewish pedigree. And in some cases, like with eggplant campanata in Sicily, Jews were likely to first were were likely to first develop and eat the dish that eventually went on to have much more mainstream appeal. But most of the foods that are thought of as Jewish actually hold dual identities. In America, things like beet borscht, sauerkraut, stuffed cabbage, pierogi, and apple strudel are typically associated with the Jewish community because Central and Eastern European Jewish immigrants help popularize them here in America. But in their home countries, everyone enjoys variations on, this, on these foods. Persian Jews, meanwhile, swoon over the same crunchy, toddy capped rice dishes as their non-Jewish Iranian neighbors. In recent years, Criticism has mounted against those who define Middle Eastern and North African foods like falafel, hummus, shakshuka as Israeli and therefore Jewish by extension. The relatively young politically supercharged country is often accused of cultural and culinary approbation, appropriation of Arabic cuisine. Of course, Israel is filled with remarkable cultural diversity, including Arab communities living within the same country and Jews hailing from Arab countries who arguably have their own longstanding relationships with Levantine cooking. The problem comes back to those making claims of exclusivity. Yes, falafel, hummus, and the like are Israeli because these dishes are fundamental to the people who live there, but they are no means Israel's alone. When Israeli chef Meir Adoni opened a restaurant called Noor in New York City, his very first restaurant in America, he was adamant about positioning his menu as modern Middle Eastern. Adoni said customers sometimes ask why he doesn't call Noor an Israeli restaurant. His answer is that Israel is only part of the equation. I want to give honor to the people who this cuisine belongs to, he said. I'm really proud that I'm Israeli and Jewish, and I want to make sure that I'm telling the right story. Adoni's nuance and sensitivity toward this matter, I believe is refreshing and not necessarily common practice. Ultimately, borrowing, and I'll underline and emphasize that word. And when you think of Jewish cuisine, I think it's a word that you need to keep in the back of your mind. Borrowing is at the heart of all Jewish cuisine. And Jewish home cooks have historically played the role of adapters and transmitters of recipes rather than necessarily innovators. But this is something to celebrate, not apologize for. Jewish cuisine's endless geographical crisscrossing and constant evolution certainly make it more difficult to define 
than a cuisine that developed within a single border. But they're also what makes Jewish food so endlessly fascinating, so culturally vital, and most importantly, so memorably delicious. And I would like to read you something that was sent to me by Suzanne Paley that I thought you might get a kick out of um, as far as this talk goes. She sent me something called Understanding Jewish Food. It's, it's titled The Atkinstein Diet. This goes back two generations, three if you're over 50. It also explains why many Jewish men died in their early 60s with a non-functional cardiovascular system and looked like today's men at 89. Before we start, there are some variations in ingredients because of the various types of Jewish taste. Polish, Litvak, Deutsch, Galicianer, Sephardic is for another time. Just as we Jews have six seasons of the year, winter, spring, summer, autumn, the slack season and the busy season, we all focus on the main ingredient, which unfortunately and undeservedly has disappeared from our diet. I'm talking, of course, about schmaltz, chicken fat. Schmaltz has for centuries been the prime ingredient in almost every Jewish dish. And I feel it's time to revive it to its rightful place in our homes. I have plans to distribute it in a green glass Gucci bottle with a label clearly saying low fat, no cholesterol, Newman's choice, extra virgin schmaltz. It can't miss. Then there are gribbonous, pieces of chicken skin deeply fried in schmaltz, onions and salt until crispy brown, Jewish bacon, this makes a great appetizer for the next cardiologist convention. There's also a nice chicken fricassee stew using the heart, gorgle, the neck, pipic, gizzard, a great delicacy, delicacy given to the favorite child, a flegel, wing, or two, some ayalach, little premature eggs, and other various chicken innards, and a broth of schmaltz, water, paprika, we also have knishes, filled dough, with the eternal question, will that be liver, beef, potato, kasha, or all four? Other time-tested favorites are kishka and its poor cousin, chelzel, chicken or gooseneck. Kishka is the gut of a cow brought by the, brought, bought by the foot at a kosher butcher. It's turned inside out scalded and scraped one end is sewn up in a mixture of flour schmaltz onions eggs salt pepper is spooned into the open end and squished down until it's full the other end is sewn and the whole thing is then boiled often after boiling it's browned in the oven so the skin becomes crispy yummy my personal all-time favorite is watching my zeta grandpa munch on boiled chicken's feet for our next course, we always had chicken soup with pieces of yellow, white, rubbery chicken skin floating in a greasy sea of luxion, noodles, farfel, broken bits of matzah, sibilus, onions, mandlach, soup nuts, knedlach, dumplings, kasha, grouts, kliskelech, and merech, mo, uh, marrow bones. The main course, as I recall, was either boiled chicken, flonken, klachtleken, hochtfleisch, chopped meat, or sometimes rib steaks which were served either well done, burnt, or cremated. Occasionally, we had barbecued liver done to a burned and hardened perfection in our own coal furnace. Since we couldn't have milk with our meat meals, beverages consisted of cheap soda, kick, Dominion Dry, seltzer, and the spritz bottles. In Philadelphia, it was usually Frank's, Black Cherry Vishniak. Growing up Jewish, if you're Jewish and grew up in the city, with a large Jewish population or a Gentile with Jewish friends and associates, the following will evoke heartfelt memories. The Yiddish word for today is polkis, translation thighs. Please note the word has been traced back to the language of the original tribes of Israel, 
the cellulites. The only good advice that your Jewish mother gave you was, go, you might meet somebody. You grew up thinking it was normal for someone to shout, are you okay, through the bathroom door when you were there longer than three minutes. Your family dog responded to commands in Yiddish. Every Saturday morning, your father went out to the neighborhood deli for whitefish salad, whitefish chubs, lox, nova if you were rich, herring, corned beef, roast beef, coleslaw, potato salad, a half dozen huge barrel pickles, which someone reached into the brine for, and a dozen assorted bagels, cream cheese, and rye bread, sliced while he waited, all of which would be strictly off limits until Sunday morning. Every Sunday afternoon was spent visiting your grandparents or other relatives. You experienced the phenomenon of 50 people fitting into a 10 foot wide dining room, hitting each other with plastic plates, trying to get to the deli tray. You had at least one female relative who penciled on eyebrows, which were always asymmetrical. You thought pasta was stuff used exclusively for kugel and kasha for bow ties. You were as tall as your grandmother by age seven, tall as your grandfather by age seven and a half. You never knew anyone whose last name didn't end in one of five standard suffixes, Berg, Baum, Mann, Stein, and Witz. You have at least one ancestor who is somehow related to your spouse's ancestor. You thought speaking loud was normal. You think eating half a jar of dill pickles is a, whole, is a wholesome snack. Your mother or grandmother took personal pride when a Jew was noted for some accomplishment or ashamed and embarrassed when a Jew was accused of a crime as if they were relatives. You thought only non-Jews went to sleepaway colleges. Jews went to city schools unless they had scholarships or made an Ivy League school. And finally, you knew that Sunday night and the night after any Jewish holiday was designated for Chinese food, sei gesund, be healthy. Questions? You can unmute yourselves if you have questions. Well, I don't have a question, but a comment that um, when I was in rabbinical school, I did not keep kosher, but my roommate did. And I asked him, why did he keep kosher? <laughs> and his reason as to why he kept kosher was for identification, mm -hmm. that this made him feel more Jewish. Okay. I mean, there's, all, there's, there's a whole host of reasons why people will tell you that they that they keep kosher. I mean, I've I've heard identification. I've heard for holiness. I've heard because it's one of God's laws. I've heard the reason that they want their children to know what kashrut is all about, and then their kids can make a viable decision whether to keep kosher or not keep kosher. I mean, there's. I think he just froze. Yeah. Rabbi, if you can hear me, you're frozen. <laughs> it's, a, it's the first time he's been speechless. <laughs> but uh, not everybody observes kashrut in the exact same way. Uh, Rabbi, for the last minute, you were frozen. Nobody oh. could hear or could see. We didn't hear you. You were frozen in that. <laughs> He's frozen again. He's frozen again. He's uh, frozen again. <laughs> is that kosher? <laughs> is that Jewish? The gods. Are frozen angry. rabbi. Inflation <laughs> uh, <laughs> milk. <laughs> right. Suzanne, that was such a funny piece. Well, yes. Thank you, Suzanne. That was great. Yeah. I, I cut it out. I'm trying to remember. It was in the paper, I think. Either in the paper or maybe one of my friends from college sent it. I don't even remember where I found it, but when I read it, I laughed the whole time. I mean, I thought it was pretty funny. Mm. Sucking on chicken feet. Is that better? Never, yeah, none of my relatives. Huh? Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I agree. Yeah. 
chicken feet. I remember, and of course I did not, I, I was born in New York, but did not grow up in New York. But we went to New York over a vacation when I was a young girl. And I remember going to an aunt's house and my, with my grandmothers and so forth. And chicken soup, of course, was on the menu. And it was really old fashioned chicken soup with the chicken feet and everything. I loved the chicken feet. I thought that was, I thought that was so good. Well, you can still get, you can still get chicken feet. Um, I'm not interested anymore. <laughs> you can't but get, I remember you can't, the taste of distinctly. It you can't. Has, you can't get aeloch anymore, unborn eggs. That you can't get. Yeah, I've never um, heard of that one. Aeloch? Yeah, you, yeah there, there were yeah. unborn eggs that people put into chicken soup. Um, what was that did anyone, you put in? Unborn I'm egg. sorry. They're, they're called aeloch. They were unborn eggs. They were the, they were the yolks that were found in the, in the chicken. Oh. The, the people boiled and put into their chicken soup. Oh. Huh. But they're illegal. You can't you can't find them anymore. They're illegal to buy. Hmm. Um, does anyone does anyone know the the magazine um, uh, tablet tablet magazine? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Tablet magazine. A, a, the the um, the editor of Tablet magazine put out a book, the hundred most Jewish foods which um, I, I took it out of the library to, to just show you. And you'd be fascinated. Anybody wants it, I've got it. You'd be, <laughs> you'd, you'd be fascinated to, to look through it, to see what people consider to be Jewish foods and why they consider to be them Jewish foods. I mean, some of the things I would never consider as Jewish food, but but um, but they do. It's just it's just it's just sort of fascinating to read through. <laughs> Rabbi. Yep. Uh, I uh, uh, visited Israel the first time in 1970, and I remember the cuisine being there as you described a Mediterranean cuisine of salads, mostly salads, fish, things like that. When we went back there uh, several years ago, and you went into any any uh, the hotels wherever, there was this incredible Eastern European heavy Russian influence mm -hmm. on what you on what you got. The the, uh, the bakeries were all full of cinnamon, really? uh, and and I asked, and they said it was the result of that there had been a million Russians right. Yep. emigrated to, to Israel and it made a huge change in there. Yep. It made a huge difference in the yeah. cuisine uh, of Israel when when all of the Russian when all of the Russians immigrated. It made it, it made it not as big a difference, but when they airlifted the Ethiopian community <laughs> into Israel and the Mizrahi Northern African um, uh, 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 food became became quite the rage in Israel as well. It, you know, it, it's certainly buffeted by by the people who come to Israel to live, who become who become citizens. But you're right. It, it was very different after the, the Russians came to Israel to become citizens. No question. They had a there profound was, influence on the cuisine. You could also get the one thing that absolutely blew me my mind is that this is remember, this is almost 50 years between visits is all the McDonald's with yep. the Hebrew McDonald's and you can, there are kosher McDonald's and not yep. so kosher McDonald's. Yep, that's true. There are, there are those that have a tudat kasher of a certificate and those that don't. And the difference between, between them is the, the, the product that they use, but also the difference is whether or not they're closed on Shabbat and on holidays. In order for someone, in order for some establishment to get a tudat kasher, a, a, a kosher certification, they must be closed on Shabbat, completely on Shabbat. They can open after Shabbat, you know, if they want to open at 9, 10 o'clock at night in the summer, the, uh, they can do that, but they have to be closed for the 25 hours of, of Shabbat, and they have to be closed on Jewish holidays. Otherwise, no matter what kind of food, no matter how strictly it was observed in terms of the preparation, and it's not considered, it's not considered kosher. 
So, Rabbi, are you saying that if you keep kosher, you can't go to a restaurant on holidays and Shabbat? Right. Exactly. Because, because those, those restaurants that you would eat in are closed. Uh, what if they're vegetarian? If, I mean, if, if, if it's a vegetarian Chinese restaurant, it, as long as they're operating on Shabbat or on holidays, it's considered treif. It's considered non-kosher. It doesn't, again, it doesn't matter what the food is. What matters is that the, fa the fact that they're breaking the law of working on Shabbat. There are 36 forbidden forms of work on Shabbat. In other words, there are 36 things in the Torah that you have to refrain from on Shabbat and on holidays. And once you break those or break any one of those, anything that's used in that establishment is considered treif. And no one who will who is an observant Jew will um, will will use your services and, and it's again the food that they're serving doesn't matter necessarily it's what they do in terms of business practice that that would keep them away from getting a kosher certificate thank you mm -hmm. other Hello. questions uh, yes, can you uh, can you exchange money on on shabbat no. You can extend, you can, ex the banks are closed. No, but, but I mean, you, person to person, I thought you couldn't do that. No, no, you're not, you're not supposed to do any kind of business. Right. On Shabbat. So it, if, it doesn't if matter. you went to a restaurant, you couldn't pay for it anyway. Right. Right. Uh, you, well, well, the other problem is that you're carrying, you're carrying money. You're not right. permitted to carry anything on Shabbat. Yeah, but so those things have nothing breaking, to do with keeping kosher. What? That doesn't have no, anything to do with keeping kosher. Well, but it but it, but it does. does. But it, it does. But it does. It has it, to do it, with being observant. Right. It has to do with being observant. That it it, it the keeping kosher goes beyond simple. For I, I mean, I, I I'll, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, grapes, because they're used for for uh, sanctification purposes for wine. Number one. Can, Jewish wine or kosher wine can only be handled by Jews. It can only be made by Jews. It cannot be made on Shabbat or on holidays. In other words, the factories have to close on Shabbat and on holidays. They have to observe what are called the laws of Shemitah. Shemitah means every seventh year, the, the fields lie fallow. And so in every seventh year, the vineyards even though they grow the grapes, the grapes can't be harvested. They have to simply allow them to fall off the vine and they let the vines rest for that year. If that doesn't happen, then, then the wine that's made from those kinds of grapes would never be allowed to be considered to be kosher wine. So, okay. so, so kashrut extends well beyond the simple practice of how something is made it's the ethics and the practices of everything that surrounds it as well uh, are we saying that it's not possible to be an observant jew unless you keep kosher N no what i'm what i'm saying is that if you are an observant jew no you can i, I in in my framework, you can be a very observant Jew and not keep not keep kosher. You simply don't observe the laws of kashrut, but you can be an observant Jew. But those people who consider themselves observant to the point where they do everything the way it's written in the Torah and expanded on in the Talmud, um, they would not be considered by their community to be observant Jews if they were, for example, to go to a restaurant on a Friday evening, carry money, pay for it on Shabbat, that would go against being an observant Jew. What percentage of, of reform Jews would you say keep kosher? Five, maybe. Eight percent. 5%, 8%, maybe. 
Wow. Um, not, not, not many. I'll give, I'll give you an example. When I, when I was before my, my very first job was in, um, Philadelphia and, um, I was there in 1978 through 1980 and in, um, 1978, there were over because of the Northeast, which is very Jewish in Philadelphia, there were over 200 kosher butchers in Philadelphia. Today wow. in Philadelphia, there's one. Hmm. There's only one kosher butcher in Philadelphia. Hmm. And, and right. they, they're, they're, they're in the Northeast. They're, they're, they're in, in Center City, Philadelphia, there are no kosher butchers. Rabbi, uh, yes. since you seem to be, uh, have had experience both in Philadelphia and in New York, Perhaps you could resolve a, a, a dispute. Um, <laughs> if, if, I, don't, if you I, hope, order, I don't know. If, if, you order, if you order a corned beef sandwich in Philadelphia, you get it, your corned beef sliced almost razor thin. If you walk into a deli in New York and, or, and, and, and uh, order, you will get big, thick slabs of corned beef. Yep. And, and being from Philadelphia, I can't stand, understand how anybody could even eat, you know, corned beef sliced that thick. But it's the only way to do it. It's right? the only York, way to do it. the granddaughter of a New York delicatessen. Yeah. I don't know. You know, what, what's interesting also is in Philadelphia, one of the, I mean, at least when I was there, I remember going to, going to, delis and there was a place called Murray's Deli and there was a place called the uh, Corn Beef Academy in Center City, Philadelphia. And they always served their they always served their corned beef with um, Russian dressing, um, which I found. Is there any other way? Well, exactly. I found that interesting. I found that interesting. I, I mean, I was always taught that you put mustard in <coughs> corned beef or pastrami and, and I, I, the, the, I had never had it until I went to Philadelphia. It was good. It was good, but but I it was odd because they just sort of serve it as a matter of course that way in in Philadelphia in the Philadelphia area. Isn't that what like makes a it a Reuben? Is that Excuse a me? Reuben? A Reuben? Isn't that like a Reuben? Has, Reuben? Has Russian well, dressing. Reuben has Russian dressing and it's, but it's got Swiss cheese and sauerkraut. Yeah. Oh. Also, so it would definitely not be considered kosher. You know, I've been a, I've been asked the I've been asked the question. You know, there are ways to get around the laws of kashrut. For example, you know, if you if you if you have if you want to have a like a piece of cheese on a meat sandwich, okay, you can use kosher soy cheese that's mm -hmm. not made with any milk products, and there's no rennet that's used in the making of soy of the soy cheese you can use because it'll say on the package this can be used with milk or with meat and it's considered kosher because there's no milk product there's no milk product in it so there are ways there there are ways to to accomplish what you might want to do and still keep kosher um it's just not you it, it, it's not you have to think about it a little bit as to how you're as to how you're going to how you're going to do it. I mean, it's, it's like, it's also like you, you can't, for example, it, you'll never find, you'll never find sweet and low at a kosher banquet or a kosher dinner um, that serves meat because, because sweet and low is made with milk sugar. Um, so they use other substitutes. You just won't find sweet and low there. Because they know it's a non it's a non starter for people who observe who observe kashrut, and there are some people that are very picky about about checking. They check to see what they put in there. What, what they again remember kash, kasher means worthy. What's worthy of being ingested? What's worthy of being put into your into your body? It doesn't mean that it's blessed or prepared in any certain in any certain manner. It's it's what's fit to eat. I, I have a question for, for Charles. Your roommate in rabbinical school, did he keep kosher when he went out into the community? Yes. Oh, he did. Okay. Yes, I he had, did. Adam and I had friends in um, 
Massachusetts, who kept black kosher at home. I mean, down to spices and all, there were so many things that she, they considered it a personal restriction. But boy, if other friends were having lasagna with sausage in it, she'd be the first to be at their table. <laughs> no, I always no. found that kind of hypocritical. Yeah. But well, again, as I said, as I said earlier, there are different levels or different experiences of kashrut. You know, there are some people who will who will bring lobster into their house and eat it on paper plates with plastic silver. <laughs> and and, and, and they'll, they'll do it that way and they can still consider they consider their house kosher. I'm not sure that, you know, any Jew who uh, who had a meaningful understanding of kashrut would consider their house kosher, but they themselves felt that they were observing kashrut because they weren't putting it on their plates. Therefore, they weren't making their dishes and their pots treif. <laughs> I, when I when I was a little, my great grandmother would come over and she she had a glass plate, and mm -hmm. she decided that anything that put on the glass plate right. was kosher, right. and. I felt like she was a very moral person putting re family relationships over all these uh, um, eating laws. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get the morality of kosher. The Glass morality plates kosher? are non-porous. Right. So they can, once they're cleaned, they can be used, at least that's my understanding, yes, that's, they can be yeah, used for either. That's not, that's not my issue. <laughs> The issue it, is, it didn't mean, matter it what food it was. Yeah. I I don't know why that makes you a better person to keep or it doesn't it doesn't make you a better person. Uh, kashrut doesn't make you a better person. There are some people who feel a greater degree of holiness because they're observing what they consider to be God's law. I'm not sure that that translates into being a better person. Uh -huh. I don't think there's, I don't think there's a better, better is, I don't think better is the right way to describe someone who observes kashrut. They're not, they're not a better person. You know, they would say to you that, that there's the, the morality about it is the way that the animal is killed, the way that the animal is shechted, um, uh, is, is more humane. And there's a moral component. There's a moral component to that, but I don't think that they would. I don't think that they would say to you that they're more moral because they observe kashrut. I, I, I don't think that that would. I, I've never heard anybody say that they, it makes them a better person because they're. A lot of crooks keep kosher, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's you know, kashrut's been around a long time since since the Torah. Um, and, and if you, if you read the laws of Kashrut in the Torah, it's, it's almost like they're outlined. They're very cryptic. Um, the real laws, uh, I mean, it says nothing in the Torah about waiting between milk and meat that comes in the, that comes in the Talmud written much, much later, all of the delineation of how you're supposed to do Kashrut. The only thing that the Torah tells you are the, the animals that you can use, the animals that you can't use, um, um, you know, what you can do on Shabbat, what you can't do on Shabbat. It doesn't, it doesn't give you all of the specific guidelines as to how to kill the animal, as to what you must do with the blood. You know, it, it simply says we're not supposed to eat blood because blood is a life-giving force. So how the blood is removed or extracted from the animal comes about through the Talmud, okay? Um, where, you, where it has to be soaked for so many hours and then washed and then soaked again in salt so that the, the blood is drawn out of the, drawn out of the animal. And, and there's also not, not all cuts of meat are able to be used if you're going to, if you're going to keep kosher. For example, for example, the the um, the hind quarter of an animal is not is not kosher, and the reason it's not kosher was because um, when when Jacob uh, wrestled with the angel, 
uh, he limped away from that encounter with a um, uh, with a sciatic problem. Um, so anything where the sciatic nerve runs through, we we because of that encounter, we tend to not eat the part of the meat that contains the sciatic nerve. Now, if you want to, there are butchers, there are kosher butchers uh, who practice something called porging, and and they will cut the sciatic nerve out of that particular piece of meat so that you can eat it if 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 you so desire. But not every part of the cow can be can be eaten in terms of kashrut. Rabbi, can I, can I ask a question about uh, Passover? Sure. For for most of when I told actually a few years ago, rice was forbidden to conservative conservative uh, Jews, right. and then all of a sudden it was okay. Right. Because rice. The, because yes. yes, yes. Because the the um, the Kashrut Commission of the conservative movement decided a number of years ago that because rice was a staple among Sephardi Jews, it was a staple food. And if they took rice away, I mean, I mean Sephardi, Sephardic people didn't have things like potatoes and other starches, they had rice. So they decided that since so many Sephardic Jews, it was a staple of their diet, they allowed them, they allowed them to eat it as, as their starch. So that but not the Ashkenazis the, still couldn't eat it. Ashkenazi Jews were were not supposed to eat it, but now it's permitted among, right. among all Jews. It's a permitted food for for all Jews. The same I with legumes. Know that. The same with the same with legumes. Um, you know, These are not corn allowed. And things like that are now are now permitted um, in you know in the twenty first century. Well, that broadens century. my menu. And yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, actually, actually, there's, there's a lot of different things now that are permitted that used to be, that used to be forbidden. They simply made a decision that, that these things, there was no reason to forbid these things any, anymore, any longer. Why, why, if a spoon was used, um, if a, a dairy spoon was used for meat or vice versa, why did it have to get buried outside in the dirt for so many days? It didn't have to get, it didn't have to be buried. It, it could go to the mikvah and you could have koshered it in a mikvah. But if but they, absent, there was no mikvah there, then right, they buried absent, it. Absent a mikvah, in other words, they put it outside, they put it outside in the dirt so that it wouldn't be mixed with other spoons. So it would make the other spoons trafe. So they had to keep it outside for th three days. I think it was three days. Um, but it had to be in dirt. It was either three days or five days. I think it was three days. It was three days that it had to be my, mo my mother used to tell me stories. She was yeah. brought up mostly by her grandparents. Yep. Um, they yep. all lived together. And my grandmother worked. So anyway, um, her, her Baba and Zadie, you know, they brought her up. And it was a very orthodox household. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, of course, when she had her own home, finally, she kept kosher until she got sick and she had to have surgery. And it was major surgery. Um, little did she know it was cancer, but she survived for mm -hmm. 30 more years. But at the time, the doctor wanted her to in the hospital to eat bacon. Mm -hmm. And she was having a fit and the rabbi came to visit and she complained to him, tell them I can't eat bacon. And he goes, Molly, if the doctor wants you to eat bacon because the fat is nutritious for you and it's easy, mm -hmm. it's good for you, your health has to come first. Go ahead and eat the bacon. Well, well that was the end of her keeping kosher. Well, well, that you know, taste the, for bacon yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the reason the reason for that is because there's a there's a uh, a foundational a foundational rule in the Talmud which is called pikuach nefesh, and pikuach nefesh simply means in matters of life and death, and what it says is that in matters of life and death, any Jewish law can be abridged any right. Jewish law, mm. if it means the difference between life and death. 
And if this if this mattered for her life, then the rabbi was was absolutely correct in his purview of saying to her, Molly, eat the bacon, because yeah. it was it was a matter of her health. And that was that was the absolute right answer. Whether he was an Orthodox rabbi. Oh, I wasn't was questioning rabbi. it. It was. It's, it and growing up, all the, all the businesses in Stanford, Jewish businesses were closed on the high holidays, mm -hmm. with the exception of two. And, oh, God, the, the, the hubbub that it made was just incredible. But every year there were these two brothers. One owned a liquor store. They both owned liquor stores and in different locations in town. And the worst part of it, the shame of it was that their nephew by marriage was the Orthodox rabbi in town. Oh, good. Wow. wow. And they belonged to the shul. So, I mean, it was, you know, made a big oh, fuss. That, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. But the yeah, other yeah, businesses yeah. would, would yeah. try to get them to convince them to close that we should have a unified front. We need, you know, people need to know. They need to accept that this is what we do. Right. No. Well, Liquor. That's but I, but I will bet you I will bet you that Orthodox Jews did not shop there because well, hopefully were, not I don't know <laughs> I, I'm guessing that they wouldn't shop there no I don't think so I mean they, they it was open, the shame of the of the town I mean it really they were was open terrible and yeah you have to be you have to be closed you have to be closed that's why that's why in, that's why in in Israel it's it's very difficult to go, for example, um, to go to visit Israel, say during Pesach, okay? Because when 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 stores or when restaurants close for Pesach, they don't close for just two days in the beginning of Passover and two days at the end of Passover, the, the, the younger the part of Passover. They close for all eight days. So, to, you, you know, it's very difficult to find restaurants that are open uh, except in the hotels in uh, in Israel, so it's 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 hard to go during Pesach week to uh, to Israel unless you're going to eat, say, in a place like the Old City, or you're going to eat in restaurants that don't observe kashrut, that don't keep kosher. Um, you know, if you're going to do that, then there's then there's enough to choose from. But if you're looking for kosher places during Passover, the only places really to eat would be in the in the hotels. Would that be true of grocery stores too, and so no, forth? Because that no, gro grocery st grocery stores will be closed the first two days and the last two days of a holiday, which are called Yom Tov. Those are the the, the important days of the holiday. The middle days, the middle days are called Chol Amoed, which is half holidays. You can work on those days. You can conduct business on those days. You can. Um, you know, you can do anything that you normally do on the middle four days of Passover, on the middle four days of Passover. But the first two and the last two, you can't, you can't work. You have to be closed. The, the supermarkets are all closed the first two and the last two days. Everything is closed, actually, pretty much the first two and the last two days of, of, uh, of, of, of Jewish health. Sukkot is the same thing. First two days and the last two days, everything is closed. The middle days, everybody is everybody's open. And again, they only observe one day of Rosh Hashanah in uh, in Israel, so so they they're only closed for one day of, of Rosh Hashanah. It's only outside of Israel that people observe two days of, of Rosh Hashanah. Right. Hmm. So we actually, if you reform, you do it the Israeli way. You know, it's the Israeli way of doing the observing the holiday uh, of only one day you it's very difficult except maybe if you go to um a conservative synagogue in israel um they'll celebrate because they celebrate two days in america um you might get a second day service but most places in israel do not have second day services and on rosh hashanah other questions? It's a good thing we did this after the lunch, after dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. I hope you learned something tonight. Um, Thank you. Yeah. We will, I, I really I will did. Be back with a whole new list of 
adult education formats for next fall and winter, and um, we will continue our, our studying. We will continue our learning um, in the fall. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Good night, all. Looking forward to seeing you.